Hello and welcome to Listening to Seldom Heard Voices, a Bournemouth University event. My name is Emma and I'll be your host for this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Today marks the start of Pride Month here in the UK and in tonight's event we'll be exploring some of Bournemouth University's work and research with the LGBTQ plus community. Here's what we've got coming up. We have three speakers this evening who are going to be sharing two presentations. Um, Dr. Jane Cordwell will be talking about transgender and non-binary participation in swimming, followed by Dr. Christopher Pullen and Dr. Yayan Franklin, who will be talking about the needs of LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers. We'll then have around 20 minutes at the end for questions and discussion with all of our speakers. So please do use the ask a question button at the bottom right of your screen um, to share any questions that you have for all of our speakers throughout tonight's event. Um, and we'll get through as many of them as we can at the end. We'll aim to close the event at around 8.30 p.m. This is the fifth event in our online public lecture series, which is showcasing some of the ways in which Bournemouth University research is having an impact on the world around us. To tell us more, here's a short message from our Vice-Chancellor, Professor John Vinney. Sorry, I think we're just having a couple of issues showing that video. So um, I'll keep talking through some of the um, features of Crowdcast, the platform that we're using this evening, and hopefully we'll get that up for you soon. So if you've not joined us before and you've not used Crowdcast, there's just a couple of things to be aware of. Um, first of all, we're not going to be able to see or hear you. Only our speakers will have their cameras and their microphones switched on. That means the best way to interact with us and with each other is through the chat box, which is on the right hand side of your screen. So it's brilliant to see some of you already using that box to introduce yourself and say hello. Hi, Lorraine. Um, great to have you with us. Um, I'd love to hear from other people who are joining us this evening and um, let us know where you're coming from and what you're hoping to take away from tonight's event. Um, but firstly, here's a short message from our Vice Chancellor, Professor John Vinney. Thank you for joining us for this evening's public lecture, which highlights research brilliance at Bournemouth University. The lecture series covers many of our areas of academic strength, from healthy ageing to protecting the environment, championing culture and heritage, challenging marginalisation, managing crisis and disaster, and helping to support Dorset's economy. We're very proud of all the work that we do at the university and the impact that it has on the world. And I hope that this evening's lecture really provides you with a, a new insight into the work that we're doing to change the world and make it a better place. So without further ado, let's get on to tonight's event. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. Jane Cordwell, who's going to be talking to us about transgender and non-binary participation in swimming. Over to you, Jane. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jane Cordwell, and um, I'd like to thank you for attending this event this evening, especially um, the night before the sort of long weekend. Um, and it is June the 1st, so um, as you can see, I'm wearing my uh, Bournemouth University uh, rainbow T-shirt in support of Pride Month, which has now actually become Pride Months. Um, and because it is the start of um, Pride season, if you like, I'm just wondering if I could engage you a little bit with a few questions. So I suspect most of you will know the answer to the following question, and maybe you can write it in the chat. But when and where was the first Pride in the UK? So when and where was the first Pride in, in the UK? Maybe you can type it into the chat. Any answers? Good guess, 2000. It's actually a lot earlier than that. So where do we think and when? 
Yes, London. So definitely in London. And well done, Emma. 1972. So this year we are celebrating 50 years of gay pride in, in the UK. Um, maybe if there's some local people to Bournemouth, you might know the answer to the next question. So when did Born Free start organising pride? So when did Born Free start organising pride? Again, type your answer into the chat. I think you'd have to be local to maybe have a bit of insight. Um, 2005 has been suggested. Um, it was actually 2004, so close. Yeah, so 2004. So uh, Bournemouth Pride is this year will be celebrating 18 years. Um, and then this is the last question for you at the moment. Um, when is Trans Day of Visibility? So do we know when Trans Day of Visibility? What month and what date? So it's not as well known probably. Um, and the answer is the 31st of March. So relatively recently, and that started in 2009. So that's 13 years ago. And I think it started in the USA. Um, so my point is, I think it's important that we recognize the LGBTQ plus community in its entirety, but that we do not forget that there are different groups and individuals within this community that do experience different forms of prejudice, hostility and discrimination. So this evening, I want to talk about um, transgender and non-binary in particular, and uh, focus on a local group's involvement with indoor swimming. So um, as an academic who applied for some funding to do the research project, it's always important to start with um, what we already know. So um, I'd like to introduce some uh, past research findings that helped us inform the swimming project that I will talk about this evening. So there is research um, with, and it's qualitative research, and so those of you who know a little bit about research, um, you know, that's asking about people's experiences um, of, uh, of swimming. So it's not actually measurements, but it's more lived experience. So there's research with women and older adults that shows that swimming is an enjoyable physical activity. And this gives rise to physical and mental health benefits for these groups. And the reason I was interested in this previous research is because it's not about high level, elite, competitive swimming, but about swimming and what we call aquatic activity. And that might be just immersion in the water and, and playful activities within the water. So um, by groups that have come to swimming through leisure and recreation. So um, there's a kind of finding around pleasure and enjoyment and swimming. However, we know that public sport and leisure facilities are often designed and built in a way that is unwelcoming to trans individuals and, and trans groups. So lots of studies show, lots of academic studies show that um, changing rooms, toilet facilities are viewed as unsafe by trans people. Um, and this is a recurring point in the existing research. So this means that access is a fundamental barrier to indoor swimming for trans groups. Uh, what else does research tell us? Um, a significant concern for all of us um, is that health research shows that members of the LGBTQ plus community have lower levels of mental health and well-being compared with non-LGBTQ plus. And so this is a known concern. Um, for example, uh, research by McDermott in 2018, and they focused on um, the, the group they would call LGBT youth, and they, they, their research showed that there were higher risk of suicidality and self-harm compared with non-LGBT youth. And they concluded that this was a consequence of homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. 
uh, sexual and gender norms, managing sexual and gender identities across multiple life domains and being unable to talk about, about the situation. So um, again, that's the kind of umbrella term for the community. But if we focus on transgender people, there is evidence that shows that these inequalities are even greater. So um, a question for you is that why do you think it's the case that trans groups tend to experience greater health inequalities? So are there any thoughts about um, why trans individuals and trans groups within the LGBT community experience greater health inequalities? Anybody like to type into the chat? Um, any thoughts or comments or anything they already know. <laughs> sort of, uh, we've been doing a lot of teaching online and it <laughs> takes time um, for people to write things down. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got some really important comments in there. Um, yeah. If you visit the CPS, so the Criminal Prosecution Service, if you visit their website, there's they've got research that indicates that 62 to 73% of transgender people have experienced harassment and violence because they were identified as transgender. So this includes verbal abuse, threatening behavior, physical and sexual assault. So there's evidence that suggests that, you know, there's higher levels of abuse, hostility and crimes against the transgender community. And this leads to further um, isolation, which can impact on uh, well-being and uh, physical and mental health. So, you know, it is, it is a, a major concern for health professionals. Um, but there are some comments there which um, maybe we'll pick up later and discuss as well around healthcare. Um, so thinking about swimming, some of you will know that many of our sports in the UK are governed by governing bodies. And so Swim England looks after and promotes swimming at all levels. Um, and they conducted their own survey in 2017, and they found that swimming has many positive aspects and benefits for individuals and uh, communities. And in particular, you know, the, the report was titled The Health and Wellbeing Benefits of Swimming. So Swim England, as a governing body, are aware of, of the health benefits of, of, of the sport. So now we've considered what research tells us, it's clear that there are health benefits of swimming, including increased well-being. And this could be just simply being in the water. It doesn't have to be swimming up and down in lanes. Um, and research also tells us that the trans community experience high levels of discrimination, hostility, prejudice and isolation. And so it made sense when we applied for research funding to link together these two aspects to see if swimming can make a difference to transgender people's well-being and so this leads us into the swimming project and um, as part of the funded project we did qualitative research um, which included focus groups and we had um, the focus groups were held in Bournemouth Library in the triangles so some of you might know the area um, and the library is next to Flirt Calf, which some of you, you might know that area as well. So it's a, it's a very um, kind of LGBTQ plus area within Bournemouth. Um, and the artist who came to draw this illustration that you can see um, identified as non-binary. And the reason I mention this is because as researchers, as academic researchers, uh, we have an ethical responsibility to take care with where and how our research takes place. You know, and our aim is for research participants to feel safe and comfortable taking part um, in the research. And um, there's lots of information within 
this illustration and we're just going to see if we can um, zoom into some of the, the points that were, were drawn that were spoken in, in the focus groups. And whilst you're looking at, at the illustration, I'm wondering if some of you that have already made comments could um, comment further on what do you think are the challenges in terms of taking part in indoor swimming specifically? So what are the challenges in taking part in indoor swimming for um, a transgender non-binary group? If you could write those in. So swimming specifically. Yeah. Heather's written more exposed and I think, um, you know, swimming, you are exposing your body and it does make people feel quite vulnerable. Yeah. 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 So um, it's not possible to talk about the whole project this evening, um, but I have pulled out some bits that I'd like to talk about that might um, match some of the comments you're making. Um, there is more information available, uh, more details about the project and its findings. And one of the funders of the British Academy has a blog um, which is available. Um, and Bournemouth University has a project page as well. And there's a lot more information in, in those um, online platforms that we can share with you. Um, so to start off with, the project developed after two university community events held it at Bournemouth University in 2017. This is when I met Jay, who had been involved in setting up a local trans social group. The group had taken part in swimming at Pelham's Pool. So I don't know if we've got local people, but Pelham's Pool um, is kind of in the north of, of Bournemouth. Um, and so the group had gone on a couple of sessions to the pool and they privately hired the facility, which meant they had exclusive use of the pool area. So Pelham's Pool worked well because the changing area is what we call a village style. So this means there are no separate male and female changing rooms. Instead, there are individual cubicles and the group were the only people using the pool. So some of you may have visited swimming pools like this before. Uh, they're becoming more common and they're, they're common on the continent. Um, so at the time, it cost £100 to hire the pool for one hour. And this is quite expensive, really, um, for, for a group. Um, even if you have 20, it's still £5 um, each. And if you have less, obviously, it costs more money. So as a way to make the swimming regular and affordable, in 2018 and 2019, we were able to get funding to pay for private hire of the pool, which meant members of the group had free access um, to the swim sessions. After the swimming session, sitting in the cafeteria area of the leisure centre, we asked if people would draw or write about how they felt about the swim sessions. So during 2018 and 2019, there were 11 um, monthly swim sessions and participants produced 63 drawings. Um, and not everybody drew, some people wrote comments. So this comment captures a number of important points. So um, I'll read it as well for you because I'm not sure some of you are using um, phones and, and uh, iPads maybe. So um, trans swim is the first time in 15 years that I've been swimming. I feel safe here. It's beyond words how it feels to let all guard down and just swim and relax. It feels normal in a way that I am normally denied. It reminds me that me and my body are normal. Normal as in worthy of respect, worthy of self-love, worthy of living. And so this comment, um, well, it's more of a, a kind of um, statement, I suppose. Um, this reflected 
other people's experiences as well. So it was a common theme for members of the group was that they had stopped going swimming because it felt unsafe for them to do so. So the trans group swim felt safe. And this meant that participants experienced being in a swimming pool as enjoyable and they felt comfortable and positive about their bodies. And these feelings are in the context of their past experiences of sport, changing rooms and having to fit into a binary arrangement of girls and boys, PE in particular, and, and other sporting activities. So, you know, there's only two options, the binary of being in a girls team or in a boys team or girls changing rooms or boys changing rooms. So this was discussed during the focus groups and illustrated here in this crop from the larger picture. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of comment in the middle in the speech bubble, physical activity is important, but it's so hard to integrate in sport. So, you know, I think most of the population, um, regardless of age or, or, or demographic background, you know, we're, we're aware now through health promotion that physical activity is good for us. Um, but the idea that for certain groups, there are these barriers and these challenges, so it's hard to integrate into sport. Um, during, and one of the issues, as I've already mentioned, but during the focus group research, the changing rooms were talked about a lot. There were anxieties about public space that is hostile to trans and non-binary people. The group reported most public spaces challenging. They were open about their struggles with public attitude towards them as well as the reality of the situation. So in this crop from the larger drawing, we have the internalized public attitude that being in changing rooms will have an impact on children. You know, will I make the kids trans? And the group discussion uh, realized that it's weight, it's not a thing, it doesn't happen. So, you know, these concerns that are um, often kept as thoughts and not spoken and then it was it was quite positive for the group to be able to talk about some of those challenges and, and anxieties. So moving back to some artwork by the participants after the swim sessions um, and again if I read this one out swimming is great because I'm free to relax and be myself with like-minded people who I know aren't going to judge me and won't be staring at my scars. It's fun and good exercise. You know, you're safe. So we get more insight into, you know, I, I know people make comments about exposing exposure of the body, but also um, that the kind of changing body or the body with, with scars. Um, so, and, and there is other parts of the research which the, the research participants talked about. It was good to to be able to be together in the pool and talk about their bodies as well, um, as well as being in the water and uh, engaging in some swimming and some playful activity. So we can see that the trans swim sessions were very different from being in public leisure facilities open to the public um, because participants were free from the public surveillance of them. They were with people they trusted not to judge them. So alongside removing the binary arrangement of female and male, male changing rooms and toilets, um, this trust is key to physical activity participation. So trust and feeling safe are my main criteria for taking part in physical activity, exercise and sport, which maybe some of us, you know, haven't kind of realised that, that, that kind of feeling of trust and not being judged and feeling safe. Um, so some of the drawings offer a very visual representation of these feelings of freedom, joy and pleasure. So this says, you know, the best is swim next to people as diverse. And um, it's a simple illustration, but the joy and pleasure, the water, the smiley face um, does, does tell a story that you might not capture through interview research. Um, the drawings that capture before swimming and after swimming feelings often show a big shift in mood with strong visual content. Um, and this one, for example. Um, and I just wonder if you want to have a look at it. And then um, a question for you is, um, 
or you know an invitation for you does anybody anybody want to put um in the chat their interpretation of this picture are there any anybody that would like to interpret interpret the kind of what the participants trying to um convey through the through the through the picture they've drawn Any interpretations of before and after? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Lorraine said um, pent up anger, having a, a route to escape and the joy and release. One of the drawings that we received was um, fish. So it was the swimming, you know, in the water, in the sea. And there was a big shark chasing the little fish. And they were saying, you know, the big shark's life and the little fish is me. And then afterwards they'd reversed. So the little fish were chasing the shark. So, you know, that was that kind of feeling of um, being able to challenge or escape from the, the kind of dominant of always being um, chased or... or um, kind of judged if you like yeah having to break through so this exploding um and then the trans flag you know this kind of um pride around being able to be out and free and freedom um around uh, being transgender and swimming so um i think what was good about the project for me anyway as a researcher an academic researcher was the participants drawings and the professional illustration of the focus groups so often academic research is written and sub submitted to journals and this means the public rarely get to see the findings um, unless you you know you can get online and find academic journals so um, one of the things we did with the artwork, so before COVID lockdown in January and February 2020, the funding allowed us to hire art gallery space at the Lighthouse in Paul, which is a regional art centre. Um, and this meant that the drawings were on display during LGBT History Month um, and in quite a prominent position. So on, on, a, on a stairwell from entering to going up to the bar and theatre area. Um, and also in February 2020, we had Bournemouth University Art Gallery space in a large foyer entrance to four lecture theatres. And so as students waited for their lectures, they were able to view the drawings. And um, both of those um, gallery spaces stayed up longer than um, the February because of lockdown. So they were there for a lot longer, which was which was kind of nice as well. Um, we were able to get some feedback from the public at the Lighthouse in Paul because we left feedback cards and we kind of encouraged them to do drawings as well, as you can see on the postcards here. So uh, one set of feedback we got, I thought it was a fantastic experience for me and my daughter. Thank you for helping us to get rid of her exam stress. I think it is beautiful. It made my day please more like this. So at the end of the 11 private hire swim sessions and just before COVID 2020, we met with the duty manager of Pelham's Pool. So I'd sent him a brief non-academic report of the findings from the research. Um, and he was very interested in the research and keen to keep the opportunities open for the group. Um, and we did experience a lot of support from staff working at Pelham's and this included um, lifeguards, um, reception staff, you know, so that there was a, a kind of feeling of, of being welcomed by staff who probably did not receive any training in, in um, you know, LGBT or transgender um, participation, but on a human level, very welcoming. So when I met the duty manager, we discussed a once a month pay as you go system where we were able to try this out twice, and we were able to try it out twice in the summer of 2020. But um, like with a lot of qualitative research, 
the ongoing COVID situation meant this was interrupted. So human contact with research participants, people having experiences in, in swimming pools and, and, and facilities that got closed down and opened up and closed down again. And we didn't really find our feet during um, 2021. So the project was a success for the, you know, the period of time, 2018, 19, 20. Um, and then COVID has had an impact on, on, on the research. Um, before I end the session, um, I wonder if hearing about the project, is there one thing you would say to providers of sport, especially swimming, that could improve the opportunities for transgender and non-binary participants. So if you could write into the chat, is there one thing, and I know it's difficult because there are probably lots of things, but is there one thing you would say to providers of sport, especially swimming, that could improve the opportunities for transgender and non-binary participants? Yes, yeah, so maybe the infrastructure, the design of buildings. Yep, yeah, that's a good point, Abby. And the group were able to wear, because um, it was private hire, they were able to wear shorts and T-shirts and binders. Um, so that was kind of one thing that, and also some um, participants were able to, felt comfortable enough um, to go topless before operation. Um, and the the lifeguards um, became familiar and aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, knowing that leisure facilities are welcoming because you don't know, you know, it's like it's because of all the public um, challenge towards marginalised groups, you, you never know whether somebody's actually welcoming um, towards towards marginalized groups that's a, that's an excellent point thank you everybody um i think i'll i'll close it there and and hand over and hand back thank you jane that was really interesting and it was really um valuable to see how positive the responses were to being able to swim um, so I think I'd turn the question that you asked our audience back onto you what one thing would you like to see swimming pools and other public leisure spaces um, do to help these communities feel more comfortable and confident in using their facilities I think I, I do think so I've, I've conducted some other research just after this one um, with the Hampshire organization um, and did a focus group at a leisure center in uh, I think it was Basingstoke um, and the, the, the research was with the staff and they wanted to know how they could make it more welcoming um, because they seem to have the skills to work with marginalised groups but hadn't worked with particularly LGBT or trans groups. So we talked about maybe visual symbols. So, you know, if you, if you go to a new city, you can usually find... Um, cafes or bars or places that are welcoming through seeing a flag, you know, like a rainbow flag or a transgender flag. So these little signs and symbols that suggest that it's okay to be in this space um, might be something um, that facilities could do. Um, the, the, the community will be familiar with those signs and symbols as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Jane. And Jane will be joining us later in the event for um, the question and answer session. So it's great to see some questions already coming in. Um, please do continue to share those as the event goes on. Um, and you can also vote on each other's questions as well. So if you spot a question in there that you'd particularly like us to answer at the end of the event, uh, click on the little arrow to the left hand side of that to upvote it. And we'll start by addressing the most popular questions in our discussion. Before I introduce our next speakers for this evening, uh, Dr. Christopher Pullen and Dr. Yian Franklin, um, who are going to be talking about the experiences of LGBTQ plus refugees, um, we've got a short video that we'd like to share with you. 
We're really proud here at Bournemouth University of the contribution that we make to the world around us, inspiring learning, advancing knowledge and enriching society. Here's our BU story. Hopefully that short video has just given you a bit of an insight into some of the things that we're doing here at Bournemouth University. Now it's time to welcome our second speakers for this evening, uh, Chris and Yayan, who are going to be talking about their project working with LGBTQ plus refugees and hearing more about their experiences. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Chris and Yayan now. Hi there. I'll just, uh, I'll just, uh... Uh, say a few words of introductions. Chris, uh, Chris is muted at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Yian Franklin, and uh, I'm a co-investigator on uh, this project. And um, Chris, Chris Pullen, uh, Dr. Chris Pullen is the principal investigator. So we're here to talk about our British Academy-funded research project which is called Understanding LGBTQ Refugees and Asylum Seekers Support Needs Through Listening to Autobiographical Storytelling that we recently completed. I think, um, Chris, you're ready. Okay, I'm, I'm on now, so it's okay. Yeah. So, so, technical issues, there are always something happening. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce um, Jan and myself in a little moment, but I first wanted to say um, uh, about Jane's uh, project. Um, I've heard of Jane's project, and also in some ways, her work inspired our project. So there's a connection with Jane already. Uh, we very much appreciate her, her work and, uh, and we're inspired by it. But I also want to say, I apologize, I'm not wearing a Pride t-shirt. And also, if I'm honest, the last time, time I saw Jane was three years ago at, at Bournemouth Pride before the event of the lockdown. So um, uh, I want to say there's a connection with Jane and um, we very much appreciate the work she's done. In this presentation, um, we want you to put stuff in the chat, which would be great, but we haven't designed it quite the same way as Jane did with those questions. So please don't, free, don't feel you're not included because you are included, um, but um, feel free to add things in the chat. So I'll just introduce uh, the project a little bit more and then over to Jain. Um, so I'm Chris Pullen. Um, I've actually been with um, Bournemouth University for about 20 years for my my sins, I suppose you could say. I'm an associate professor in media inclusivity 
at the Department of Media Production. And I'm here with Jan, who's already um, in, announced himself, who's a lecturer in history and politics and the Department of Humanities. We're going to tell you about a project um, that was a long time in its um, um, conception, which is called um, Understanding LGBT Refugees and Asylum Seekers Support Needs through listening to autobiographical spelling, uh, story, storytelling that we recently completed. And we also um, have to announce that we worked alongside Menjia Schaller, um, who is head of the Queer uh, Network for Europe. And she was a, a very substantial part of our research. So although Menjia is not with us today, I want to um, uh, admit that she is a, a significant contributor to this research and part of the research we're going to talk about will include her, her discussions as well. So the project was like um, um, Jane's project funded by the British Academy um, which was a great achievement uh, for us to, to get this project and um, we explored social issues with LGBT uh, silent claimants here in the UK um, and I'll give you a small background to this, but I'll give you a little bit more of a background later on. Um, I've researched LGBT people over the years in media representations, and this was a kind of a key um, uh, thing that we want to cover, which was this significance of LGBT refugees here in the UK. So now I'm going to hand over to Yayan, um, who, who, um, who thankfully filled in when the technology was a little bit tricky, uh, and he'll tell you about the experiences of LGBT refugees, and I'll come back in a minute. Thank you. So, yeah, I think, you know, the fundamental uh, uh, experience and um, situation uh, I want to get into here in, in talking about LGBTQ refugees, uh, we're talking about uh, people who've often faced uh, persecution or discrimination um, in their home countries and have um, sought safer environments. Um, they, um, this, you know, they, they often see, have sought refuge because they come from countries where homosexual, homosexuality is criminalized. And you can see from the map on the slide, um, that there are 71 countries, um, sadly that, that uh, criminalize LGBT people in some form, uh, uh 11 including 11 countries where people can face the death penalty, at least in theory, um, uh, for, just for having same same sex um, uh, a relationship and sexual uh, sexual partners. And, th you know, this, uh, you know, when when uh, they come to the host country, often they do, you know, they are uh, subject to discrimination and and sometimes that with LGBTQ refugees sometimes or asylum seekers that sometimes that includes from the sort of refugee communities themselves that they're, they're sometimes um, uh, marginalized um, uh, and um, this the whole the whole issue I think has been brought into sharp relief by the latest sort of overhaul of the asylum system so the home office policy, which I'm sure you're all aware of, of relocating asylum seekers to Rwanda for processing. And, you know, recently there's, there was a story reporting on the fact, you know, that LGBT asylum seekers could face uh, persecution um, upon being sent to Rwanda. And despite this, the government's refusal to refuse to exempt them from this policy as it stands. And, uh, uh, you know, in, the, in uh, two weeks time, um, the policy is is due to begin. Um, the uh, in terms of the refugee experience, um, you know, we're all familiar with stories in terms of the risks people face making journeys of refugee as refugees, um, and often this has involved sort of conceding their identity as they pass through unfamiliar places and, and within refugee communities. When they uh, arrive at the UK, um, as part of the process of, see of seeking asylum, um, one of the key things is that um, they face an asylum or substantive interview, which we'll focus on now. 
Um, what, during our project, the people that, um, that we've interviewed have often talked about a sort of culture of disbelief that comes out of the Home Office. And what does this mean? I, um, maybe we can, uh, we can ask, uh, ask you to put in comments, actually, uh, at this point. So what, what does this mean, the sort of culture of disbelief? Um, it's certainly the case that many asylum seekers have come from cultures where they felt obligated to be silent about their sexual identity. And so suddenly they arrive in a country or a context where they're sort of forced really to speak about experiences which they've never, uh, rarely or never previously voiced um, in a language which isn't their own, you know, and in other words, you know, so they've had to hide their sexual identity for perhaps their whole lives and are suddenly expected to uh, speak about it openly and not only that, to, but to sort of provide evidence um, in terms of their of their sexuality. And uh, it's interesting that sometimes uh, these asylum claims are refused because uh, the the asylum seeker didn't provide a sufficiently sort of emotional account at the interview. And there's this uh, expectation that they will have this sort of emotional sort of uh, uh, sort of release and so on. But you know the the fact is that people who've had to sort of repress their emotions for such a long time. Uh, aren't going to sort of present in this sort of emotional way. And uh, there's other issues such as the having to sort of conform to Western stereotypes of sexuality in terms of appearance, dress, sort of comportment and vocabulary, you know, the sort of language that we, that, you know, we use of being gay, coming out, etc., which is often not familiar. So um, as well as the sort of... Um, this culture of disbelief, um, the, uh, you know, I, I, we have an example actually, um, if we have time from uh, an interview with um, Mood Guba, who is someone that uh, was involved in our project actually. And this is from a podcast um, uh, called Bus Busy Being Black and uh, where Maud speaks about her own experiences oh. i sought asylum because of my sexuality so i went through the process the asylum pro okay, okay we might we might have a, a problem, a problem with that, with that. Um, um do, do, I do you have, do a, have a listen get to the home office can, and explain who i am what's going on but he it wasn't what I expected in terms of, um, you know, you're met, I was met with the, like this war of disbelief because we almost have to fit a certain stereotype of what a lesbian looks like, what a gay, pe what a gay man looks like. Or it, it's, it's difficult and what people forget is that you're coming from a place where you've had to hide who you are and for some, most of your life. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so um, um, I really recommend um, that listening to that interview. Um, it's very, very interesting and sort of moving. So, um, aside from the sort of um, sort of the the actual asylum interview, um, the um, So, you know, I mentioned the, um, the providing evidence and LGBT organizations can help in sort of pulling together evidence um, to, to support the, you know, the, uh, the case workers can, can provide that, uh, help them provide that evidence. Um, so we talked about difficulties of sort of convincing interviewers and so on. Um, in terms of like the, um, the asylum claim, um, there's, you know, often the asylum claims are rejected on sort of often, you know, grounds that, that seem that seem fairly specious, you know, and um, the newspaper headlines sort of sh sort of reveal uh, the extent to which, you know, the, the, the uh, asylum claims are being sort of re refused and rejected. Um, 
you know, when people arrive and seek asylum, sometimes they're ineligible for support from the Home Office and can be given government provided temporary accommodation. But sometimes this accommodation is um, not safe or not suitable because it means sharing with other refugees, some some of whom may hold homophobic um, or transphobic views. And this um, this means, you know, that uh, that uh, LGBT re refugees sort of uh, uh, can beho become homeless for this reason because they uh, they leave the temporary accommodation for fears for their own safety and so and so on um, they asylum seeker if they receive a, a positive asylum decision then they only have a 20-day period to find housing which can be difficult due to the fact they don't have a credit background and they have no recourse to public funds, which increases the likelihood that they'll be faced with financial issues. So I'll, um, there's also, you know, there's all sorts of issues really, including um, issues of, seek, of finding health care, uh, some of which, you know, we was sort of touched on in the previous session in a, in a certain way, in terms of uh, uh, GPs and practices sometimes being, uh, uh, being not being as helpful as they could. Um, so I'll, I'll hand back to, to Chris at this point to talk more about uh, the, the background of the project. Okay, so we just, um, thanks very much, Jan. That gave us some clear insights into um, very disturbing issues that surround LGBT uh, refugees um, in the UK and across Europe, if not the world. Uh, but uh, we just want to tell you a little bit how we became involved in this research, because we, we are not actually social sciences um, people. We're were um, media researchers who've become involved in this um, through these issues. So just to give a little bit of background, I've, I've researched LGBT people over many years and um, I've produced a number of books, mostly about representations of LGBT people in the media. And um, I even did my PhD at Bournemouth. And, um, um, but in doing my research, I got inspired um, by the actions of media producers to tell the story of LGBT people. And I even conceived this idea that um, LGBT people are sort of involving themselves in what you might call new storytelling. They're telling their stories and people are now listening. But I think what transpired with this project was a, um, through encountering other texts such as Parvez Sharma's Jihad for Love, a very good documentary film produced quite a few years now about the Islamic faith and LGBT people, and also doing some other research on um, LGBT transnational identity, was the significance of um, non-Western LGBT people and how in many ways they're kind of leading the way. I'm not saying we've got our rights and um, everything's fine, but I think there are some very brave people um, that we are seeing in the media, and this is how we first came across this subject, uh, particularly in some documentaries on LGBT migrants. I remember seeing one, um, I think called Europe's Gay Refugees, uh, and also another one on um, refugees being, um, or other uh, gay people in Russia being taunted and persecuted, and how much um, the perspective of non-Western people actually is informing a lot of the debates uh, in media studies as much as anything. Uh, but in 2018, um, um, I did, did an article on some LGBT refugees uh, in, in actual documentaries and theorized this um, uh, theory by a, a media theorist called Sarah Ahmed about the pursuit of happiness. And this sort of theory is kind of a, a sort of performative theory, but the idea that people kind of seek happiness in arriving in places. And one of her state case studies was um, migrants and how there's some sort of search for happiness by moving from one place to another to in order to find happiness. Now, we know, obviously, even shifting from one place to another, you don't necessarily always find happiness. And sometimes you find the same things come with you in the new place you've been to. But uh, this, this early article I wrote um, was about how um, refugees are coming to Europe and how they're sort of uh, finding difficulties, but also kind of finding support. And I think in this documentary, I particularly found support um, or other they supported people in, in Germany. And, and this is kind of the background of our research because we see this sort of research happening in other places. Yain and I um, also did write about refugees um, in, a, in our media studies well, way as well. And we talked about the dreamers 
which is a, um, a movement in the United States of um, undocumented queer youth, uh, mostly Latino people coming from Mexico um, that seem to um, uh, be forming a sort of a performative political rights movement. And that sort of enabled us to think about this type of research. Um, so we were inspired by the bravery and the confidence of LGBT plus asylum claims um, in these media representations. And we also saw the things that were happening in Europe uh, and how um, we thought we wanted to find out what was happening in the UK. Um, so essentially, we began to sort of look at um, what happened in mainstream organizations. And we had this sort of theory uh, in, in thinking about this research, because we read other research about LGBT refugees, mostly based on discussions in Europe. And one of the sort of hypotheses that came up, which I thought was very interesting, and I think is partially true, is that LGBT migrants often seek help from LGBT help groups as their first port of call, not necessarily from refugee help groups. So we came to this research thinking, should we find out if LGBT migrants are actually um, going to LGBT help groups to get most of their help because they might be understood there better, or are they going to other places? Um, and by doing this research, we wanted to um, find out more. So, so we had, there was no research on um, uh, experiences in the UK. We understand that places like maybe London, Liverpool, Birmingham, might have um, LGBT communities and there might be more support there, but we want to find out what might happen across the, the breadth of the UK. So whether someone in Birmingham received the same help as, as somebody else in um, Brighton or uh, Bournemouth or Glasgow or Belfast, which are some of the key areas that um, we, we did the research on. So now Jan's going to just tell you a little bit about how we did the research, the sort of things that were involved in the actual research. So over to you, Jan, for a moment. Okay, so yeah, we spoke to um, uh, various um, refugee support groups across the UK, as you saw on the map. And um, Chris, you know, did these interviews, which uh, tw there were 20 in total. Um, one of the things that we had happen, you know, as soon as we embarked on this project was that COVID hit, of course. And so we had to change a sort of modus operandi, really, in a lot of ways because we were intending to talk um, to asylum seekers and refugees and, you know, in sort of face-to-face -face encounters and so on, which obviously wasn't, wasn't possible. And, you know, we did, we did um, talk to, we did talk to some, but we changed tack a little bit and decided to focus on the support groups themselves, the N sort of NGOs basically, or um, small sort of advocacy, advocacy or support groups and uh, th I think there was a there's a good rationale for this because there have been a lot of research projects about refugees and, and asylum seekers in the past where they've just used these groups as sort of gatekeepers basically to be able to access testimony from refugees and asylum seekers and you know so not really considering the sort of viewpoints of those people who work closely and directly with them and um, I think that, uh, you know, they have a sort of very, very good um, overview of the whole, the whole process, these groups, and particularly, you know, the, the way in which the sort of asylum or integration pathways, um, you know, you, with the LGBT ref asylum seekers and refugees you can either go down the lgbt route or the refugee route and there are not many organizations that recognize both sort of sides of the person's identities you know where they can sort of feel addressed as a whole rather than just you know an organization representing the refugee half or this the the their sexual identity and uh so based on the interviews we sort of made um, different discoveries which Chris can uh, talk us through. Okay, so um, so we, we found very, very different experiences from those that are supporting LGBT plus uh, asylum claimants. Um, and these are very, very different organizations. So for example, um, um, organi the organization in Belfast was a very sophisticated, um, uh, very well-funded organization. 
Uh, but some of the organizations elsewhere were probably more like small um, charities working almost independently. So we found that many of the managers were often working on their own in isolation, particularly um, with the impact of COVID. We found that um, in talking to the NGO managers, which we um, nurtured a relationship over the course of the, the project. And, and incidentally, this is probably something we probably couldn't have done so well had we saw people face to face. So ironically, one of the things I think we flagged up already is that despite the terrible uh, effect of the pandemic, in many ways, we learned online skills um, and, and connectivities that actually led us to draw in far more people than we ever imagined possible. But what we found is in talking to these diverse people from very different organizations, some were very much working almost on their own. And two or three of the managers from different organizations, uh, particularly one in Cardiff and I think one in Birmingham, which we we, we got to know very well, they were sort of, um, you know, all, almost spending their own money to help find food for people when uh, food was short because the uh, some and Clements weren't able to leave their, their, their homes. So there's very much um, um, a very big commitment um, from those managers. We also did interview, as, as the Ian said, some actual LGBT asylum claimants, but these were sort of allowed to be gatekeeps through those organizations because we couldn't get easily access to them. But those, those interviews did provide some very uh, rich and resourceful um, information. And I remember in one of my particular interviews, um, um, uh, being very um, inspired by uh, uh, the the depth of the information from from the the interviewee, and particularly um, telling um, a story of how this person um, was totally disbelieved when they came to the UK, even though they had tangible evidence of their LGBT status, uh, because they had. And uh, I know it's going to sound strange to you, but they had twice married someone in the, the country of their origin. Now, obviously, they had married someone to c conceal their identity and to sort of pres preserve themselves. But when their family had found out um, that they're LGBT, they, obviously their life was threatened. So they, they came to the UK. But uh, there was a, a definitely a culture of disbelief. And I think this is one of the key things is this... Um, uh, we discovered, I think one of our kind of findings to some degree, is how decisions are relatively arbitrary and this culture of disbelief is, is, is very much, very much there. And we also kind of want to sort of flag up um, in talking about the, um, um, the, the plus side of the, the project was um, you know, meeting these individuals who much, very much have a profound commitment to individuals and also the great work of a couple of organizations we encountered, which are very, very uh, much well known in, in the domain, which is um, uh, Micro Rainbow uh, and Rainbow Migration. Now, uh, Mood works for um, um, uh, Micro Rainbow, which is, which is the um, uh, housing organization. And, and Micro Rainbow Migration, sorry, the names are very similar, is a, a, an advocate uh, organization that helps people with legal support. But both those organizations participated in the research and very much helped us. Uh, but interesting, thinking about those two organizations, it was intriguing when we talked to the participants who came from uh, smaller organizations across the UK, including mental health organizations, LGBT organizations, church organizations, how in some ways um, they felt awkward um, um, in their position as outsiders. So one of the key things, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, in a little while, is this idea of um, trying to make connections between them. So we kind of focused on um, the complex relationship between LGBT refugees and um, uh, uh, religion came up as an, an interesting finding from the project. So prior to this project, we stereotypically had considered, or certainly I did, that religion would be a major problem for LGBT people. And, and in some ways it can be and in some countries and in some contexts. But we also found it was um, a significant factor of those um, that were being given help. So a lot of the people we interviewed from the smaller organizations, smaller organizations, actually either were supported by multi-faith churches or maybe they'd actually been pastors previously. So that was kind of an interesting project uh, we, we found out. And I think one of the key things from the very first interview to, with uh, um, an LGBT refugee in Scotland who actually runs the department now, he gave me a very emotional account of how he felt so accepted when he went to this sort of multi-faith church for the first time 
um, after many years of feeling totally rejected by the church. So uh, very much um, a, a significant factor. This, this context of religion, we hadn't really thought or factored that in, I suppose. But um, I think what did um, um, we, we do with these results? Well, um, we have produced some outputs already. Um, Menja, our colleague, which um, we, we mentioned at the start, she's already produced an academic journal article. Uh, and Jan and I are also working on a, um, an academic article about the networking nature. So Menja's article, um, who sadly can't be with us tonight, uh, is about the, the project itself, the, the discussions from people, and the, the situation LGBT refugees find themselves in. Whereas Jan and, and myself's article is about the networking possibility of bringing these people together. Um, but um, what about the impact of the research? Well, uh, we uh, one of the great things about um, uh, this project was we had a, a, a workshop as part of this. So not only did we interview people and we sort of uh, look, heard about the experiences that people were, were, were having, but we actually had the benefit of, of having a workshop where we actually had more organizations um, come to us and, and discuss their situation. And um, one of the most important parts was the fact that we presented evidence to um, a select committee. For those of you who are unaware, um, a select committee is a small group of MPs or members of the House of Lords that is set, to, set up to investigate a specific issue in detail. Often in news reports, you see a report from a select committee where uh, people are being grilled about something to report on a particular issue. Now, there was um, a select committee um, call from the Women's Inequalities about LGBT refugees. And very fortunately, uh, because our calls spread out to a range of different people, someone from a select committee um, actually attended our workshop. And we, um, Menja and myself, uh, along with the support of Yayan, wrote a report, a written report for a select committee. And um, in this report, I'll just very briefly sum up some of those findings uh, for you. Um, we talked about um, three key areas. One was advocacy and policy, um, which is that we're saying the current policies in place are not fit for purpose in protecting or caring for LGBT asylum claimants, while we find that NGOs, you know, it, uh, charities are doing good work and better understanding their needs. So what we're saying is there, there isn't enough um, support out there for LGBT refugees. We also see training and mentoring is a key issue. Um, officials working in the asylum system need training regards the nuances and diversity of LGBT plus asylum claimants and mentoring schemes organized by NGOs, such as a, a very good one we dealt with, Sahir House in Liverpool, offer good practice uh, in this area. So we saw that training is needed and mentoring. And but also more significantly, emergency support and housing, LGBTI ref asylum claimants uh, experience very poor service overall when they're being offered housing in the UK and because and, they're often given um, housing with other people who might not understand LGBT identity. Also, they may be put with their own communities and which who they may feel oppression from because LGBT people often don't want to reveal their identity. Um, but there are also specialized organizations like Micro Rainbow, which um, we had Mood talk earlier, who offer um, excellent um, service. They don't actually cover the whole of the UK, but they offer LGBT housing for LGBT people. And there are many obstacles that inhibit the ability um, to uh, gain access to emergency support. So the key sort of key three areas are visibility, LGBT people seeking asylum appear invisible in the system unless they reveal themselves, and this can be a problem as a, the credibility assessment, the response is one often of hostility, prejudice, or disbelief. Cases uh, may be denied or deemed as not credi credible, so often they're not believed. And also, as um, uh, James already talked about in the first part, homo and transphobia, the, lang the language in the asylum interviews um, um, is often not welcome to, um, um, to trans and, and, and LGBT people, and it can seem kind of homophobic if people aren't trained to understand uh, the, the, um, the, the language. So often they rely on 
gender binary narratives and practices that are detrimental for the safety of trans and non-binary persons and also stereotyping we've already talked about this a little bit already immigration staff often rely on western concepts and this is very important western concepts of sexuality and gender identity to identify lgbtqi persons leaving many lgbt class and claimants to be overlooked where there's very little awareness of LGBT identity outside those sort of stereotypes. So th those are the kind of the, the, the broad findings of our project. Um, and um, because we sort of, um, our research revealed um, that a lot of people in organizations are they were isolated. Um, one of the key things we did was kind of um, create a network. Now, this is very much in its early stages. So these participants, these NGOs across the, those, those, those parts of the UK already mentioned, we create, we've already created an, a formal network with them and we're kind of sharing discussions about best, pro, um, best practice. And um, uh, I think I'll end there because I know Emma's got possibly a question for us there so that's that for the moment. and also we look forward for your questions in the chat in a moment brilliant thank you chris and yai and that's really interesting it sounds like you've got some valuable insights already but what does the future hold for this project and what are you hoping to achieve through that network that you've now established yeah so uh, obviously we know this question so uh, we're going to give you the answer um so i think we're, we wanted to um improve on the network that we've created so i think the project left us um with a, a wealth of emotion and good things that were happening all across um uh, the ngo sector for lgbt refugees but you kind of wanted to do what we really want to do which i think would demonstrate kind of an impact is to develop an online platform uh, where we could connect those people now we're we're connecting with them informally we're having sort of um, uh, meetings every couple of months and discussing um, concerns that those those people have, and um, we we want to sort of share their stories. and And I'll give you a kind of an anecdote for a future project. If so, we're looking to create a network and uh, experiment with it. So these net these NGOs can connect with each other. They can share their best practice. And they can also maybe gain access or our LGBT refugees can gain access through this portal. Um, but we, we also have discovered uh, another element of the project that came up from um, uh, Shireen at um, Sahir House, one of our, 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 our um, NGO uh, participants. And it was quite interesting this. And I think this creates a, a, a divide in, in thought um, because Shireen was um, telling us that she was concerned for the welfare of um, LGBT uh, refugees who use online social networking. Um, now, some people would say, and quite rightly, uh, online social networking can be beneficial because people can maybe um, uh, get social connectivity, maybe they can experiment with their identity, maybe they can sort of play out some identity issue. But what she said she had discovered was uh, when people come to um, uh, a different country and they see the freedom of uh, social networking sometimes it's actually problematic and, tra and traumatic for participants because they may become vulnerable through sort of like having multiple identities maybe being vulnerable or maybe totally concealing the fact that they're refugee to gain access access to other people so we had this moment in one of our workshops which i thought was really interesting where a divide of a conversation emerged where many people were saying Online social networking is really good for LGBT people because they can um, meet new people and, and it's liberating. And also we had this uh, other conversation that maybe some instances LGBT refugees are, are becoming vulnerable through social networking. So our next project might be that. Um, and, and anything you want to add to that, Jai? And obviously we've been part of this for some time. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on that project, for example, maybe? You could, well, just yeah, just to mention very quickly that yeah, the, the I think what the core um, interesting problem there is that you know asylum seekers and refugees sort of needing to sort of juggle multiple sort of profiles and avatar avatars, you know, uh, for social media, um, it creates anxiety because they don't know to which sort of which version of themselves 
you know they are they presenting which to perform for which audience so is it the home country is it the host country is it the lgbt community is it the refugee com community is it like the mainstream sort of um sort of society so that can cause a lot of anxiety and it's i don't think uh, i certainly hadn't sort of considered that before and i don't think chris had either so you know it's that's potentially i think could be a really interesting sort of uh, research uh, project yeah yeah, that sounds really interesting. And again, I think it shows the benefits of working with these communities and listening to them and, and the suggestions yes. that they have rather than trying to impose kind of what we think are the questions that should be answered. Actually, listening to these communities and some of the issues that they're facing um, to begin with means that we, we are asking questions that we might not have thought of ourselves. So, yeah, really valuable. Um, I'm going to welcome back Jane now for the question and answer session. And we've had a few questions come in, but please do feel free to pop more in the in the box as we go. Um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the time that we've got left. So um, first question was from Laura and is for Jane. Um, the creative pictures by participants are fantastic. How did you agree with participants how their pictures would be used in the galleries and reports? Thanks for a great talk. So, Jane, um, you yeah, it's a good question. Um, when we do research in universities, we have to go through ethics, ethical clearance, and um, there's always, um, in most places and, and, and most guidelines, um, you give your research participants a, what we call a participant information sheet, so you tell them about the research. And, and in amongst there, um, you know, th there's the kind of um, purpose of the study and, and what might happen with, 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 with the information they provide. So that was a generic sort of ethical um, uh, process we went through. Um, and the other one was um, went along to their Friday night sessions. So they'd have every other week they'd have Friday night sessions. And some of them, we managed to um, book a room at Bournemouth University um, for that because it was difficult for the group to get a room sometimes free of charge. And during those Friday night sessions, um, I would take along like the big illustration, you know, I took copies of that along and if people wanted copies of it, they could have copies of it. Um, so the funding was good in terms of providing those resources. And then we talked about what we wanted to do with the artwork. So there was funding to hire art space, and, and so it was agreed amongst the group that um, it would be a good idea to display their artwork. And some of the group went along to, to see the artwork at, at Paul Lighthouse and, and really enjoyed it. So it's a kind of ethical process, um, a process of asking the group what would they like to do um, and, and kind of get into to that, that position. The, the, there are links to academic journals and there are drawings in there. So it does say on the ethical processes here that, you know, material will be used in published journals as well. But because it's anonymous, you know, then, then it, it's seen as, 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 as OK. So there's two strands, really. There's the formal strand of ethical clearance and there's a strand of what the group want to do with their work. I hope that answers the question. And did they enjoy getting to share their experiences and emotions through drawing rather than having to kind of articulate it. Do you think you got insights that you might not have otherwise if you purely sort of asked them questions um, in a verbal form? I think so. And I think being able to sit off straight away afterwards. So, you know, you come out of the pool, you come out of the changing rooms, people still got wet hair, you smell of chlorine. So it's still very kind of sensual, you know, it's still felt through the body and then being able to kind of either draw not you know people were shy about drawing not everybody can draw we're lucky in Bournemouth that we have an arts university and some of the students at the arts university were, were part of the group as well so we did have some good drawers um, but yeah I think the drawings for me as a qualitative researcher did add more than just words you know interview words and quotes from interviews and some of it is difficult to interpret as well and I think that makes it quite interesting in terms of what was the actual experience um, for them. Well, yeah, even in the chat box earlier, everybody had different interpretations of that image that you showed and, and took different things from it. So I think it's a really interesting way of getting people to share their emotions and also of interpreting that as well. So great. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Um, another question is from Abby for you, Jane. So she's spoken about some of the other ways in which swimming might not be a particularly inclusive activity in terms of um, it's often a very white sport and leisure activity. So was this the case with your participants as well? And do you have any reflections on this, if so? 
Yeah, the, the, there are a number of um, swimming groups around. So when we started the research, it, we were able to find some other groups. Um, one of the issues is sustainability and, and keeping the groups going. Um, and, and there are predominantly um, white participants um, that take part in swimming. And I think in one of the papers I wrote, you know, I wrote that it was a limitation of the research that we didn't have, um, you know, kind of stories from non, non-white or minority ethnic groups or, or different ethnicities. Um, but swimming is known. I mean, things are changing, but there are certain sports that are known, like tennis is changing slowly, swimming, rowing is changing in slowly. So some of our sort of historical national sports are beginning to change a bit. And I think the governing bodies are, are struggling with some of that inclusion as well. So it's, it's around ethnicity. And so I think it's a really important point. Brilliant, thank you. And we've got a question for Chris and Yayan as well from Beth. Um, so although homosexuality and homosexual acts are not illegal in Rwanda, homosexuality is still considered a taboo topic. Do you think that the current Home Office policy to relocate refugees there will have more negative consequences for those of the LGBTQ plus community if they move? I don't know which one of you wants to take that. Yayan, yeah, do you want to go I, with that? I'll take a stab at it. I mean, it's a big question and um, a very urgent question, really. I think what I would say is that, as as you quite rightly say, that um, homosexuality is, isn't uh, illegal, but it's sort of um, the you know that that's a sort of only on paper, it, if I can put it in a, in that way. It's that discrimination is still rife um, in Rwanda, and I think you know that uh, that there are, you know problems uh, accessing healthcare you know I, we sort of touched on this earlier but um there i think you know the the there's there's so, you, know, you know sometimes sort of a judgmental attitude on the part of healthcare professionals and um there's certainly sort of a country where um religion plays a part in terms of uh many people sort of believing that homosexuality is unnatural and so there i think there you know there is a certain amount of discrimination and there is i believe also sort of conversion therapy which is a very controversial issue and very top you know very topical issue as well so i believe you know recently the british government sort of refused to sort of ban conversion therapy which is very controversial and led to uh the uh um there was going to be a, a, a very large sort of LGBT sort of um, international conference, which uh, a lot of um, the sponsors pulled out because of because of the government's decision not to to to, to outlaw and ban conversion therapy. So, I hope that sort of at least partly answers it. Yeah, I think um, just thinking more broadly, uh, one of the biggest things we came across in this project is how unclear it is about uh, the experience of LGBT refugees in different countries. Obviously, in some countries, and there are home office um, data, or is there reports about how dangerous or, 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 or how, how illegal or how not it might be. But it does seem to be very much a gray area because in many countries, um, um, LGBT people feel vulnerable, regardless of protections. And um, uh, obviously, the, the Rwanda thing is quite topical at the moment. Um, and um, it's, it's come to make this come to the fore more. But um, I think the experience of people we talked to that knew more about it this than we did um, says how much the, um, the reporting on those countries isn't always necessarily the best reporting on what actually happens in those countries and how vulnerable those people might feel, so to speak. Right, we're almost out of time, but I just have one final question. It's Pride Month, um, as we've, we've said throughout tonight's event. And, and Chris, you mentioned that you've been researching in this area for a long time. So have you seen a change in kind of attitudes and awareness because of things like Pride? Does Pride help in terms of um, helping create that sense of yeah, pride around cool. this community? Or do you think there's still a way to go? 
That's a fabulous question, actually, because I can honestly say, until I went on the float with Jane and the others three years ago, I had never really supported Pride. I just thought, oh, it's, you know, it's not a great thing. But that that event in Bournemouth three years ago uh, was like a revolutionary event for me because I'm, I felt the love from the crowd. And I think Pride still has that very much important status. And it was wonderful to see the university support it uh, so much. So I think um, I'm not an expert on Pride. I'm sure Jane knows far more about Pride than me uh, uh, and the history of it. But I, I generally believe that uh, there is a very long way to go. Um, in regards of uh, public perceptions and support for people. But I do see, you know, from my perspective, I see Pride um, as an event where people can um, uh, be out there and, and, and sort of uh, uh, show off and uh, be with other people and, and, and kind of feel the love, which I certainly felt on that float three years ago. Um, but I also do see, um, um, and I'm not, and I, I love Pride now, um, but I also do see it's a bit, become a little bit more commodified. And I think people need to get to grasp with the political issues of LGBT identity. Um, I'm sure we've all seen the film Pride. Um, and in the closing sequence of that film, when the minors turn up and they support LGBT people and that potentially led to changes in the law, that, that's what it should be. It should be um, uh, a celebratory thing, but also it still remains a very much a political thing. And, I, and maybe I'm a little bit skeptical, but I, I still believe we've got a very long way to go uh, in terms of um, uh, gaining those rights. Um, but I think it's great that Pride is such a, a wonderful event that we can all share and be together. Brilliant. Yeah, you know, Jane, do you want to um, share any of your thoughts? I guess um, for me, it's more about, and I agree, you know, we can criticize the commercialization of, of, of Pride, but it's about um, activism and and sort of, um, non-violent sort of protest, if you like. So, you know, by having visibility um, and activist groups and, you know, I got, I, I wrote something for the conversation recently about Jake Daniels coming out. And I think, you know, he's 17 and he plays professional men's football. And I think, you know, we've talked about the legal component and the social component, but culture, changing culture and changing culture in men's football. So I do think things like Pride as part of a bigger activism movement that's gained momentum over 50 years in this country has had an impact on culture. So which is kind of separate from social attitude and reform and, and separate from legal um, reform. You know, it's more about particular groups and subgroups and cultural groups. So nobody would have thought, you know, after how Justin Fashionu was treated 30 odd years ago, you know, it's kind of this moment of possibly a cultural shift in, in men's professional football. So I think it has a place within activism. Brilliant. Yeah, Ian, anything from you on, on Pride and its role? Well, just to, yeah, I mean, just to, mention like I it is a 50th anniversary as Jane mentioned which is remarkable and uh yeah I did some been doing some research recently into sort of the gay liberation front of the 70s who you know pioneered pride one thing that I found that they sort of wrote about at the time was that um the flip side to pride is anger and this is where the sort of political political side mm -hmm. comes in I think because they talked about how you know in overcoming stigma um there's then the sort of effort to examine society okay where does stigma come from and and to try and attack it you know so that's the sort of i think it it um in the way it was advertised you can see it in that sort of archival document and so on it was very much a celebration from the start it was very much a party but it also had this sort of serious aspect of like being critical of society Brilliant. Thank you all for those reflections and for your time this evening of sharing the insights into your work and research. I've really enjoyed tonight's event and I hope um, our audience have too. Um, thank you to all of our audience for coming along this evening, for engaging with us in the chat and for asking questions as well. Um, this is the fifth event in our online public lecture series. So if you have enjoyed tonight's event, um, we've got more to come. So please do click on the green button that's at the bottom of your screen if you want to find out more um, about 
upcoming events, um, or you can visit the Bournemouth University website as well. Um, we'll be sharing a follow-up email after tonight's event um, with some information and links to some of the resources and the projects that we mentioned, so do keep an eye out for that. And we'll also have a feedback survey as well, so please do fill that out and let us know how you found tonight's event, as it really helps us to ensure that we're putting on the best events possible. Um, we're going to close this event now, but um, you'll be able to use the chat um, still, so please do share any final thoughts or comments in there. Um, and you'll also be able to view the recording of tonight's event by clicking on the same link that you used to join us tonight. Um, all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for joining us this evening and good night. Have a lovely bank holiday weekend and enjoy Pride, um, however you're celebrating it as well. Good night. Mm -hmm. Thanks.